the speaker, Patrick Lacroix. We're very pleased to welcome Patrick this evening. He's not presented before, but it is good to see new people and young people coming in and moving up. Patrick was born and raised in Quebec. He earned his master's degree in history at Brock, and then he went to the University of New Hampshire on a Fulbright scholarship. Back in my time, that was prestigious, and I think it still is, Patrick. His doctoral dissertation, John F. Kennedy and the Politics of Faith, is set to appear from the University Press of Kansas next spring. Beyond his work on church and state issues in modern American history, Dr. Lacroix is widely published in the field of French Canadian migrations and Franco American studies. His research has appeared in the Catholic Historical Review, the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, and the Revue d'Histoire de l'Amérique Française. He's taught at Phillips Exeter, at Bishops, at Mount St. Vincent, and he is currently an adjunct at Acadia University. Now, this evening, Patrick is going to present to us on emigration and the failure of Canadian elites in the 19th century. He's looking at Quebec and comparing it with Nova Scotia. Patrick, welcome. Over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So bear with me here as I try to find my presentation and try to share it. Um, this will just take a second. All right. So I think we're good. I'll just move toolbars around. The struggle of working in this age. But thank you, um, Lois, for that generous introduction. And I appreciate everyone joining tonight. It's truly a pleasure and a privilege um, to be joining the society uh, tonight with this lecture of being able to share the glimpse of an idea of a beginning of a paper. Uh, so this is still a work in progress. Um, so I look forward to hearing your questions, your comments, your critique as well. Uh, hopefully we'll have a strong, vigorous, interesting discussion at the end. Um, so stay tuned for that, I guess, uh, if not for the lecture itself. So behind this provocative title um, of failure um, on the part of elites in the 19th century lies the story of, in my view, immigration, which in this period was seen as exhibit A of structural and policy failures. Um, across just about every province and territory um, of this settler society. And I think you'll find tonight that there are a lot of points of connection uh, to Paul Bennett's talk from last month, for those of you who were in attendance for that one. It's also available on YouTube. Um, so it's a great talk. And I think that you'll see this as kind of a logical follow-up um, for those of you who, like me, enjoyed watching that lecture and hearing Paul talk. So we'll start today with the old story. The story as many of us heard it um, in school uh, as recently as a generation ago. And still today, it's very difficult to tell the story of Canada without starting, or at least post-Confederation Canada, without starting with this guy. And of course, recently we've taken down McDonald from his literal and figurative perch this in a country with really far too few pedestals, um, and mostly, uh, justly so, on account of his attitude towards Indigenous peoples, uh, discriminat discriminatory and oppressive policies towards Indigenous peoples. But outside of that relationship, which should have a large bearing on his legacy, we still see him as the builder, the one who is driving history in late 19th century Canada. So as the story goes, it's Johnny MacDonald, who's the real builder in this period, and not Alexander Mackenzie, for instance, the stonemason turned editor and then liberal leader. So not only did MacDonald pour the foundations of the recognizable settler state 
that we have today. He established a lot of institutions that we don't find in the original DNA Act. Um, the RCMP, which of course is mixed into his legacy with uh, indigenous peoples, but also um, you know, the CPR, uh, the Intercolonial Railway, of course, is built into the BNA Act. Um, and we should also mention, crucially, since we're presenting him here as a builder, and is, you know, he's still widely presented as a builder across Canadian history, as the guy who erected the big tariff wall of 1879, the man behind the national policy. And even though the national policy was then mixed in through O.D. Skelton with railway construction and Western expansion as part of kind of this cohesive uh, unitary plan. The reality is that it was a lot more complex and the national policy initially was just a fairly desperate move in the face of a high tariff American administration. And so McDonald adapted by raising commercial duties, tariffs on American products. And that became so essential to Canadian national identity through the election of 1911, of course, and all the way to the Mulroney era. So McDonald is still very much uh, weaved into the fabric of this country. And this is what we had in the Globe and Mail as recently as last month. McDonald, flawed though he was, laid the foundation for something that is fundamental to our lives, namely this country itself, which of course should be identified as a colonizing settler state, but sure. It's an accomplishment so big that it tends to get overlooked. McDonald's legacy is Canada. And for all the reinterpretation that's occurred, uh, again, justly so recently, especially in regard to Indigenous peoples and also various other minority groups, including Chinese Canadians, French Canadians, and so forth, um, that is still very much with us. So tonight, I want to offer an alternative tale, um, not because I want to take down McDonald even further. Um, he has a complex legacy that we need to address. And I think that addressing that legacy goes through um, a fairly healthy critique of not only his policies, but close observation of the criticism he faced in his own time, because his consecration as a great builder only occurred um, after he had left the political scene, after he had died. So here's an alternative story that of course goes through the path of immigration to the U.S. Um, I'll offer a few words about Prosper Bander. Many of you who follow my blog or have um, become acquainted with some of my pub publications have met, uh, virtually speaking, historically speaking, Prosper Bander, who grew up in Quebec in the 1840s and 50s and was really a booster for the young nation of Canada until the early 1880s when he just became so disillusioned with policies and policymaking in Quebec City and Ottawa that he left. He went to Boston and became a vociferous critic of Canadian policies, Canadian, the Canadian experiment as a whole, and he started advocating for annexation to the US. So his was a bit of a marginal position. Uh, we can't claim that annexation became um, a true a mainstream political alternative, but his views and his criticism was actually quite widely shared and widely expressed in the 1880s. So here he's quoting Richard Cartwright, and this was published in an American publication in which he um, points to the fact that um, at this point in time, in the 1880s, there are about 2 million, and that seems to be just about a fair estimate, 2 million Canadians British North Americans, people born in British North America, outside the US, of course. Um, and Richard Cartwright, this is Prosper Bender basically explaining Cartwright's position, denounced the extravagance, corruption, and general misgovernment of the Dominion with its high tariff and neglected resources as the chief cause of this enormous loss of people. With a debt of nearly $300 million of you know, chunk changed nowadays, but a lot of money back then, and a large deficit, additional taxation, having to pay for the late Northwest resistance, monopolies like the CPR, and such unprofitable works as the Intercolonial Railway, etc. It's no wonder, he argued, Richard Cartwright, that Canadians became discouraged 
left for homes in a country possessing much greater resources, population, boundless new territory, uh, free to all, a declining debt, and the grandest prospects that ever stirred the imagination, the great republic. I don't think we'd find much people expressing that nowadays, uh, but certainly in the 1880s, that was a common, fairly common position. And he argued, and this is Prosper Bender speaking, annexing Canadians at the present rate to the US leaves the annexation of their country only a question of time. If so many people are moving to the US, voting with their feet, then eventually Canada will have no choice but to see the writing on the wall and to join its fate to that of the US. So here's just a brief outline um, in these next few slides of depopulation itself and destinations. Um, I wish I could spend more time talking about um, the transplanted societies we find in the Northeast, New England, but also New York State um, in the late 19th century. Um, I've done a lot of work on that. I would love to talk more about that. I see Jesse Martino is in the audience and he'd be able to speak to that as well. Um, but I will say just a few words in passing that in late 1840s and 1850s, Canada becomes a donor nation in migratory terms. So from having a positive, positive balance in terms of migration of being a receiving notion, increasingly, as we see in the chart, it's really in the red in terms of migration from the, actually from the late 1850s, truly, to um, the end of the century when Clifford Sifton's policies start to change with the increasing settlement of the West and a more aggressive uh, recruitment policy in Europe, not to mention uh, the opening up of the West to settlers, which of course comes at yet more of a cost to indigenous peoples. But this is the period truly we're talking about, uh, the 1860s to the turn of the century, really, to the Laureate era. And it is in this time that we have people increasingly expressing doubts about the future of this nation that is losing more and more people every year and whose economic prospects, uh, not to speak of political ones, are increasingly uncertain. And that's something that we seldom see, seldom see and that's certainly something that I wasn't seeing when I was growing up, going through elementary school, high school. Um, there was very little of this questioning um, of actual policies in textbooks, and maybe that's not the purpose of textbooks, uh, but certainly we just took Canada as being this teleological destined entity um, that was meant to succeed. And of course, there's nothing written in the fabric of Canada that said that the British North America Act, which was the thir third constitution in just about three generations, was the one that would make it. And that's kind of stating the obvious here in Nova Scotia, where we had a strong anti-confederate uh, anti feeling, anti-confederation uh, feeling. Um, and of course, it, it's worth remembering as well that the first secessionist or sovereignist movement in Canada um, after Confederation is born not in Quebec, but in Nova Scotia. And a lot of that, as I hope to argue and show today, has a lot to do with emigration and the fact that Canada cannot retain its own people. So a few bold points, sorry as I move my screen here just so I can see it. Um, the, in terms of emigration, the scope, I won't bore you after, with slide after slide of statistics. But this is pretty damning. Approximately 3 million British North Americans or Canadians leave British North America or the Dominion of Canada over the course of nearly a century. Um, this in a nation which at the time of the Great War had about 8 million people. And two thirds of those are um, English American or English Canadian, sorry. Um, so the estimate is that about 900,000, 2 million French Canadians left the St. Lawrence Valley um, and areas predominantly settled by French Canadians over the course of that century. The remainder would have been English Canadians, but we hear a lot less about that expatriation. There's a rich body of um, literature, historical research regarding that French Canadian diaspora, partly because of the cultural concerns stirred 
by the emigration and the fear of assimilation within the greater English-speaking Canadian whole. Um, and yet that English-speaking migration was proportionally just as strong as it was in the St. Lawrence River Valley. So as uh, Richard Gwynn, and I'm not in the business or the habit of quoting him uh, with all due respect, but he argues, and quite persuasively so, that one of the few reliable measures of economic and national life prior to the 20th century is emigration that we get from passenger manifestos, not so much at this time from border crossings, but certainly from census data, and as well as the decennial censuses uh, sensei? No, censuses, uh, that we have from this period, um, we have on the American side a lot of bidecennial sentence, uh, censuses. So on top of the federal ones, um, at mid-decade would be a state one. So there's a lot of information coming in from the U.S. about the increasing Canadian population on that side of the border, all to the concern not just of American policymakers, but of Canadian ones as well even though McDonald himself would rarely broach the subject for obvious reasons, which again, I'll explore just a little bit in this uh, talk. All right, so I've mentioned this, uh, Richard Field of Research in French Canada, um, even though still today, Franco-Americans really occupy just a very small part of, um, of, textbook, uh, uh, of textbooks that are published in Quebec, there's very little attention to um, this whole other self, uh, this whole other Quebec or French Canada that grew up in mill towns in New England. So there's a lot of scholarly research, but in terms of popular memory, collective memory, um, that uh, awareness of this Canada outside of Canada, this expatriated French Canada um, is certainly not as strong as uh, arguably it should be, even though it's there historiographically. All right, and finally, just to conclude, um, a lot of what I draw today in terms of secondary literature um, on top of, uh, excuse me, on top of primary resources that I've dug up, I'm quoting from Alan Brooks, uh, leading scholar, arguably, um, if not, not arguably, uh, of maritime expatriation. Betsy Beattie wrote this uh, fascinating, compelling article about female, uh, single young female maritimers who worked in Lynn, Massachusetts. Uh, Bruno Ramirez, who still at it in Montreal. Uh, Randy Wittes. And on Acadians, not a whole lot of work on um, Acadian emigration in this specific period, meaning the late 19th century. But I'm also drawing from uh, Fernand Arsenault's work uh, dating back from the, to the 1980s. All right, so that's a brief outline of the issue as I see it. Um, and all this, of course, is not so much to, again, bring down people from their perches, but to explore other opportunities that were out there, other paths that um, Canadians could have taken politically, um, either federally or at the provincial level. Um, and so in my talk today, I'll be kind of addressing uh, both of those options. Uh, and of course, it's worthwhile to look both at Quebec and Nova Scotia, partly because, again, proportionally, um, these are some of the provinces that lose the most in terms of population in the late 19th century. Uh, it goes to show by looking at different provinces that this is a nationwide problem, whereas often in Quebec this is depicted as a, a national, meaning a Quebec-centric, a provincial issue, when in fact all of Canada is touched by the problem of depopulation in the late 19th century. So that's kind of the benefit of looking at both of these provinces not to mention the fact that there are vastly different cultural concerns and cultural identities mixed into each province. So it does give us a sense of different um, justifications for policy action in the field of emigration, repatriation, colonization, uh, and so forth. All right, so here I'm drawing um, exclusively from Alan Brooks who wrote this major dis dissertation, influential dissertation on immigration from the Maritimes. And his starting point is really the 1860s. Um, I do wanna mention that in other research I've done, um, I've looked at Canadian or British North American participants in the Mexican American war um, in the 1840s. And I found, um, I wanna get the number right, 51 Nova Scotians 
who we know fought in the Mexican-American War. Uh, many of those would have been already present on American soil before enlisting to fight in the 1840s. So, um, and Joseph Howe is discussing the issue of emigration in connection with railway construction in the 1850s. So Brooks uses late 1860s as his starting point for his dissertation, but the fact is um, emigration has already a long history in the Maritimes by that point. So he, here are his five shocks, the five disruptions that cause an economic crisis and therefore lead to expatriation in late 1860s. And this is specifically in regard to the Maritimes and most of his focus really is on Nova Scotia. First, the end of the US Civil War and the rebuilding of a true national market in the US, very significant. The abrogation of the Treaty of Reciprocity, which means a return to, um, I won't say a high tariff policy on the part of the US, but certainly a higher tariff policy in regard to, or in relation to the free trade or limited free trade that existed up to 1866. So again, that's another economic shock, especially in terms of um, access to the American market uh, for natural resources, of which there was a great need during the Civil War. So end of the Civil War, 1865, following year, the abrogation of the treaty, 1866. Confederation is significant insofar as it creates a new political center. And I think that ties in really well with uh, Paul Bennett's talk from last, uh, last month in terms of the building of a new east-west axis and one that's not east-west simply in terms of being transatlantic, but increasingly continental and Nova Scotia being increasingly at the mercy of policies being um, made by predominantly Ontarian and Quebec delegations in the parliament in Ottawa. So in the 1870s, Canada is taken for a ride. Uh, the Panic of 1873 starts in the U.S. The major industrial depression that follows really starts in the U.S. at a time when Canada is just really starting to industrialize. Um, and finally, quite poetically, Brooks points out that this is an age of transition tied to um, industrialization, modernization, and the use of new technologies, especially in shipping and transportation. So he sees the transition from wooden to steel haul ships as a major disruption economically for this shipbuilding and shipping province. So there's a transition, a change from the age of wood, wind and sail to iron, coal and rail. A new era in which Nova Scotia appears to be, at least in the 1860s and 70s, at a major disadvantage. So that's the situation in Nova Scotia around the time of Confederation, which many of you are aware of. Again, there's a richer histori historiographical conversation and um, debate in Quebec dating back to the 1960s, one that was sparked by Fernand Ouellet, the great historian that, you know, many of you discussed in graduate seminars way back when. I don't think it's happening so much anymore. It's kind of been forgotten. But Fernand Ouellet identified a major agricultural crisis tied to um, the loss of a market for wheat in Britain. That was the core of his argument. I'm simplifying here, um, perhaps unfairly so. Um, but he viewed this as being a failure to adapt to market conditions on the part of French Canadians, a failure to discard archaic techniques in agriculture, um, or to meet new market forces for that uh, matter. So that was his view. Um, the reality is that there was a lot happening that uh, farmers could not address from a purely economic standpoint, uh, notably population growth. So from 1815 to the early 1840s, the population of Lower Canada doubled. So that's a major uh, population that had to be absorbed by the economy um, at a time when there were, of course, economic disruptions, political disruptions. You might think of the rebellions, of course, um, but the de devastation caused by the wheat midge in the 1830s is real. Uh, that is a major challenge that farmers have to face uh, dealing with this pest, as well as the increasing continental integration of markets with the building of new canals and the very early beginnings of uh, the building of a 
continental cross-border um, railway network that would again expose Quebec farmers to competition in the Great Lakes area, for instance, or the American Midwest. So arguably French Canadian farmers do adapt by turning to other crops, um, but I'll go back to this point in just a second. Uh, it's not really fashionable anymore to talk about Malthus and Malthusian crises, but the fact is that uh, if we did, really, this would be a textbook case, partly because in Quebec, you can only expand so far uh, before you're tilling rocks, right? So there's limited space for a, an enormously growing population in the as early as the early 19th century, if not before. And that demand has to be met. Those mouths had to, have to be fed. So it is an enormous challenge. And there was a point at which Quebec started to evolve towards a market economy, and it certainly did, uh, but to live and thrive in a market economy, you need cash, and it became increasingly difficult to get that cash for these reasons. So part of it is less opportunity to purchase or inherit a farm, because again, you have to move to a different type of farming to still make money, to still be commercially viable, to compete with farmers from the Midwest. And there are these shocks in the lumber industry, so providing less opportunity, especially during winter time, um, a lot of young men would work on the family farm in the summer and go into the lumber camps during the winter. But there are major shocks in the lumber industry tied to new tariff policies being drafted in Britain in the 1830s and 40s. Um, so there are major shocks and it becomes more difficult to access um, any work in the lumber industry in this period. So you have these young men who are restless and who don't see any opportunity to form a household of their own or to prepare to marry and raise a family and support a family without going elsewhere if those resources are not available in Quebec. All right, so in regard to the modernization issue, and this is a case that's notably made by Bruno Ramirez, um, again, the Montreal historian, um, and he argues that increasingly this crisis um, and this challenge of adapting to new market forces will cleave the agricultural class into those who can adapt, um, who have the means, and those who are just living on the brink, who might be in frontier regions, who cannot take their goods to market, who might have large families, who might not have a prosperous farm, who might be in debt, and those people are the ones who increasingly will turn outward. So typically those who are able to grow their acreage and continue to thrive and pass it on, pass the farm down to a son um, are the ones who are better off. So really um, it's not the rabble who are moving to the US but it's certainly people who are doing so for economic reasons um, or who have the greatest rationale for doing so economically. And um, Many of you are kind of aware of, about this, that Montreal and Quebec City grow fairly slowly uh, by 19th century standards if we compare them to other modern metropolis, metropolis. Um, so they're not able to absorb those workers through industry. All right, so that's kind of the background, the framework I'm operating under. Uh, there are distinct causes in each area, but there's a lot of overlap as well in terms of accessing land, accessing markets as well. So I'll just go over this really quickly. Um, these are some of the destinations uh, in red that you see that are French Canadian destinations in the US. Um, I purposely chose this map partly because um, it goes to show that there's no real natural barrier between Canada and the US at a time when there's hardly any border security or hardly any border. Um, once those railways are built, then it is easy access uh, to American cities and people can be there from Montreal, from Sherbrooke um, within a day, a little more than 12 hours in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, and that's counting a lot of stops along the way. So easy access to those markets. Uh, the big crown of red markers around Boston, that's a great arc of predominantly manufacturing cities where people can work in the short term, earn easy wages and initially pay off debts that they have in Canada and Quebec. Uh, but in time, it will become the main source of income for them um, in their transplanted lives in the U.S. Uh, the white dots are predominantly English-Canadian destinations. Uh, 
Portland, Boston, Providence, major port cities that attract a lot of maritimers um, that offer actually steamboat connections, steamship connect connections to Halifax and Yarmouth and St. John and a bunch of other places around the Maritimes. Um, I should add Lynn, I mentioned the female workers in the Schwinn boot industry in Lynn, Massachusetts. That's basically a suburb, an extended suburb of Boston now, so that's really close to Boston. One area where we find French Canadians, Acadians, and a large proportion of English Canadians um, that I haven't indicated on the map is kind of on the uh, right-hand side in central Maine, places like Orno and Old Town. So all these are major industrial centers that are that have the jobs or the markets to absorb uh, landless uh, farmers' sons and daughters from uh, Nova Scotia and Quebec. But anyway, the main thrust of my research is really in terms of policy and policy solutions, policy adaptation in Canada. So this is kind of larger context. Um, and I do want to share really quickly the language surrounding um, this exodus. And that word will become quite significant. So this immigration is depicted as an epidemic. Um, so the first piece that I'm sharing here at the moment, that's from my Vermont newspaper, but they're basically quoting from a Nova Scotia one. So emigration by the late 1860s is an epidemic. And this is, this really echoes what I was saying earlier uh, from Prosper Bender, my friend and yours, people are being annexed by their own act to the US. So individually, they're annexing themselves economically and in time politically as well. And this is from an Annapolis Valley newspaper from Bridgewater. Again, the use of the word exodus. And the fact that this is happening alarmingly rapidly. So there is genuine concern that is expressed at this time in the press. So those concerned the Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia situation. On this slide, I have um, articles that address the Quebec situation. Uh, here on the left, we have a piece from the Montreal Gazette, still around, still kicking today, uh, which states that it is only within comparatively recent years that both the clergy and lay leaders of the self-expatriated Canadians began to ask themselves earnestly what the issue of the exodus was likely to be, meaning the end point, what was gonna come of it. Um, so note that this article is from 1892 and they're claiming that it's only recently, who knows, maybe the 1870s or 80s that people have started to really think about it and try to find solutions to it. Um, the article is a bit misleading because it's only when people started coming up with effective solutions uh, people had been studying the problem of emigration and in investigating it since the 1840s, ever since the Irish migration to Canada started dropping off and Canada became a donor nation. Once again, so it, by 1892, people had been talking about immigration for the better part of a half century, but it's only more lately, 1870s, 1880s, that policy proposals were being put forth, um, which we'll talk about in just a moment, to address that issue. So the article is just a little bit misleading. Uh, one thing that isn't really is that Quebec was being transferred bodily to places like Manchester, New Hampshire, Fall River, Massachusetts, uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, as well as some of the crown jewels of Franco-America. So really Quebec society was being transplanted in a very meaningful sense. People are trying to recreate their home society in a new industrial environment. Um, and again, hundreds of thousands of French Canadians did so in the late 19th century. All right, so I've had a number of interesting conversations, and I guess this is kind of the, I don't want to say the most controversial part of my remarks tonight, or in general in regard to this research project, but there have been a lot of questions, a lot of discussions uh, about, you know, whether anything could be done about it. With the limited means available to government in the late 19th century, whether the government had the means had the original thinking, the analytical skills, the policy tools, you name it, to really address a problem of this size, which of course would mean addressing also the economic factors behind the immense nationwide um, and arguably structural problem of immigration. So um, I'll offer more than a few 
uh, policy open options that are open to governments in terms of addressing immigration. So first of all, they could replace the people who are leaving. And there was a lot of talk in Nova Scotia about replacing people who are going to Portland, Providence, and Boston. So this was a theoretically a duty of the Federal Department of Agriculture uh, because the presumption was that people would become good traditional kind of white um, settler farmers uh, that would be sent out to out west. And Nova Scotia wanted its fair share. It wanted to get people to work the farms of Nova Scotia, farms allegedly abandoned by young farmers' sons who were more attracted by the bright lights of Boston, not to mention terrible coffee. So that was one option that was available to them uh, to simply replace. Um, and the fact is, with the Department of Agriculture in Ottawa, uh, there would, wouldn't really be a uh, structured, cohesive means of attracting people until the Sifton era, and part of that had simply to do with funding. Um, domestic colonization was particularly strong in Quebec, meaning opening up new areas for settlement outside of the narrow band of land across or around the St. Lawrence River Valley. Um, so La Patrie in the eastern townships of Quebec, where I'm from, not from La Patrie, but from that region, uh, that was meant to be a settlement colony for people who are coming back from the U.S. in hopes of attracting them back, luring them back to an ag agricultural lifestyle. So domestic colonization, meaning just better settling or expanding uh, within the bounds of the province. And that kind of gets me angry and riled up uh, because they were really sending people out to, to starve. Um, they were, you know, priests who had no idea what they were talking about, and not just priests, I'm not picking on clergy here, but a lot of public officials sending people out into the woods of Quebec, basically to till rocks and to raise mosquitoes. Really, that's what came of some of these colonies uh, out in the wilderness of Quebec. Um, so people lured there under false pretenses um, and that impacted lives and caused trauma. So very difficult situation, uh, but there were some success stories. So um, I don't want to be all one-sided in regard to this. Infrastructure development, um, the intercolonial railway that I mentioned, the CPR, uh, were part of that economic strategy meant to create jobs, open up settlement, keep people here, create linkages economically towards industry. New trade arrangements, um, high tariffs and reciprocity, which I'll talk about in just, uh, in one slide, exactly. So increasing access to markets or developing the national market. Um, many of you are familiar being from this province with the Nova Scotia repeal movement. Again, the first secessionist movement in Canada doesn't come out of Quebec, it comes out of Nova Scotia, which makes comparison all the more interesting, especially in this era. Um, and once the Nova Scotia repeal movement kind of fizzles out, uh, there's a move towards other solutions, including advocating greater provincial autonomy. And Premier William Fielding, who's in office at that time in this province, in Nova Scotia, joins his friend uh, Honoré Mercier in Quebec, another liberal, uh, at an interprovincial conference. Um, and this is the real, really the basis of kind of a new pan-Canadian liberal identity um, that will really come together and cohere under Laurier when he brings a bunch of provincial premiers into his cabinet. Although that won't really change in any substantial sense, substantive sense, um, the relationship between the provinces and the federal government. But that is another option, changing the balance of responsibilities between Ottawa and the provinces. So just briefly, I'll go over these. Industrial development is one that often occurs actually in a kind of ad hoc local level with municipalities vying with one another to attract businesses and get the railway to go through, you know, their land as opposed to the neighbor because they'll, they figure they'll get station and access to markets and all that. So industrial development, annexation to the U.S., which again is, for the most part, a marginal position. Uh, there are a few windows of opportunity there where it becomes a little bit more popular in the 1880s and 1890s, um, but those are short-lived. And romantic appeals to people's love of the homestead, family ties and the love of home are the most endearing worldly attachments that can affect the human heart. <laughs> 
So you have all sorts of these, all sorts of romantic appeals being published in Quebec, in Nova Scotia, and just really across the country saying, stay at home, it's so beautiful, you're honoring your ancestors, you're doing your children a favor, don't you love, wouldn't you prefer staying at home and living up to the values you've been raised by? Uh, and there's another one here, family graveyards, um, timely, I guess, uh, in this season, but also an appeal to uh, the heart. So please stay here, we're desperate. We'll try to keep you within the balance just by um, tugging on your heartstrings. All right, Quebec, the summer of 74, uh, there's something that um, Canadian rockers should sing about, really an interesting story. First of all, I've mentioned the Panic of 1873 that causes this huge industrial depression. It's bad in the US and it's bad enough that it becomes an opportunity to bring people back to Quebec and to Nova Scotia and to other provinces. Uh, a lot of people are out of work and they're looking to come back and they're just looking for an opportunity or for the means to come back. Um, and that and the fall of the McDonald Cartier government over um, CPR subsidies and corruption, all that creates a new liberal mo moment, an opportunity for a liberal moment when uh, new prime minister, Alexander McKenzie sends old grit stalwart George Brown to the US to negotiate a free trade agreement, limited free, free trade agreement with the US and Ulysses S. Grant is in power and he goes along with it without real enthusiasm. Um, so this is a, a new opportunity because people at this point in time see the age of reciprocity from the 1850s into the 1860s as a golden age when everything is going well. Um, and that has a lot to do with things that have nothing to do with free trade, but it's being idealized. And ultimately, despite Grant's endorsement, um, the Senate will reject the free trade agreement, the proposal. Um, so that's not going to happen. And that's where history kind of fails to turn in 74 and 75. There's this great optimism that free trade will return. And this optimism is present in Quebec and Nova Scotia. Um, and the fact that it's declined, arguably more out of apathy than actual opposition in Washington, uh, basically sets the stage for the high tariff policy that McDonald is going to bring in in 1879. So if Canada can't get reciprocity on decent terms, then we're going to go 180 and push for high tariffs to build a national market. At the same time, there's a great St. Jean-Baptiste celebration in Montreal in June, just at the time that the announcement for this tentative reciprocity agreement breaks and it becomes kind of a family reunion where a lot of immigrants from American states come back and Quebecers basically sing of their love for Franco-Americans, invite them back. Um, many do, at least temporarily, but many more will head back. So this too is a lost opportunity, especially as American economic fortunes change. The economy is on the uptick by the end of the 1870s. It recovers faster than the Canadian economy which is kind of typical, and people leave again. So this is really in 74, 75, and a few years after, uh, a missed opportunity to take another path, which was absolutely credible, and Canada was really just at the mercy of what was happening south of the border, as it really always is uh, still today. Um, so I'm kind of stretching uh, my luck here with your attention. So I only have a few more slides bear with me and then we'll, um, you won't have to listen to me as much and we'll jump into a, a vigorous discussion, I'm sure. But I do want to get to Honoré Beaugrand's response. Uh, Beaugrand is better known as an author and he was um, mayor of Montreal during the smallpox epidemic in the 1880s. But here was his damning indictment of the political class, especially in terms of what it was doing in the 1860s. In the 1860s, people were more concerned, meaning leaders were more concerned with building a new constitutional state of creating the Confederation instead of looking at bread and butter issues and helping people out and focusing on preventing emigration from Canada. So here he writes, see how much of that is still applicable today. Career politicians became ministers 
the leaders became baronets. Party hacks now served as informers for, cus for customs and the police. And the honest family man sighed as he went into exile, wondering where all the taxes and public funds were going. Wondering also what exactly the purpose was of having these ministers of agriculture and commerce in Ottawa and Quebec City. What were they doing if not seeking titles and trying to build new constitutions out of pride? Um, the Maritimes, slightly different story. Uh, there's this fetishization of reciprocity, as I mentioned earlier. And it seems as though, and I'm trying to gauge this at, this at the moment in my research, it seems as though the feeling towards annexation was a lot more favorable here than in many other Canadian provinces, if not perhaps all other Canadian provinces. So there's this romance of reciprocity and the next best thing, if you can't have free trade as a country separate from the US is to simply be part of that market and join the US as uh, who knows, 30th state or whatever it is then, uh, 40th state maybe. So those, uh, there are hesitations, moments of hesitation in there from 1867 to 1887, but widespread dissatisfaction still, even after the anti-Confederate movement fizzles out with uh, Confederation. So there's a lot, a lot of hand-wringing in the press about emigration and emigration being a sign of, um, of something being terribly rotten in the state of Canada. Uh, but there's a little debate or action in legislature. I've been going through Hansard. Uh, there are a few moments, one of which I'll point to on the next slide, but very little debate. Um, and here I'm just offering a few reasons why the value of excuse me, remittances, which is just a big one for somebody whose first language is French. Um, so the money that people are bringing back or sending back to Nova Scotia from having worked in Lynn and Boston and Providence and a bunch of other places. So, that, so that's helpful to an extent for the old family farm and the old household from which these immigrants come. The potential cost of repatriation programs to the provincial treasury. Increasing agricultural acreage uh, does not require proportional labor, partly because there's a modernization of farm techniques. It's becoming more efficient. Increasingly, you'll have, you know, as we get into the 20th century, you'll get combines and a bunch of other uh, pieces of equipment that come in that don't require as many arms to work the farm. So that makes it a lot um, easier to let some people go to the U.S. to earn some cash without actually needing them physically on the farm. There is some hope vested in the national policy. Uh, there is this great classic article by T.W. Aitchison about the uneven benefits of the national policy in Nova Scotia into the 19, or sorry, 1880s. And the single-minded focus on reciprocity, the fact that that is the panacea and kind of a refusal to acknowledge um, other potential policy options. So people are really focused on reciprocity, meaning limited free trade as a solution to all their ills, which deters attention to other potential paths, especially since reciprocity would be a federal issue um, over which Halifax legislature has no control. Uh, so they're kind of passing the baton along to, um, to other policymakers. So they're kicking the ball around. All right, so I wanna talk about these. I won't talk about these um, to spare you. Uh, these are interesting cartoons from the era that show two different parts of the story. Uh, we could go into great depth with these, uh, but I do wanna conclude in a timely fashion. Um, on the left-hand side, I'll just note that it's showing how John A. McDonald's protection policy is meant to inflate the Canadian economy right, kind of a pro-conservative position. And then on the other side, the draw of the US, um, maybe culturally, but here we see business interests on the magnet um, and the withered old posts of British dominion of British power trying to hold on to fair lady Canada who um, can't help it, it's Uncle Sam, and he's a very attractive guy. Okay, so before I get to my last slide, uh, I promise there is an end in sight. I just want to quote really quickly from James A. Frazier, uh, MLA from Guysborough. All right, so going to represent the eastern side here of the province. 
And James Frazier is one of the most ardent critics of Confederation as he, st as he sits in the legislature in Halifax. And he argues in 1885, this is before the repeal movement actually gets going, he argues that the iron glove hand of Canadian greed, and it's telling that he says Canadian greed, not central Canadian. So Canada is something separate from Nova Scotia, right? In his mind, Canada is still Quebec and Ontario. So that iron gloved hand will still be clutching at the tax strings of the maritime provinces. And meanwhile, the stream of emigration will be like the brook as described by Tennyson as running on forever. And the cities by the sea will be drying up. So these two quotes might be kind of up Shirley's alley in regard to fiscal issues and um, taxation. And this is another one from a few years later. So he's still sticking to that theme. Um, and he's a bit of a loose cannon. James Frazier is a really interesting guy. If you find a picture of him, please send it to me. Um, I just wanna see his face, really. So he also argues a few years later, looking over the whole face of Nova Scotia today, I see nothing but steady emigration caused by excessive taxation. And again, this is not income tax. He's talking about the indirect taxation of tariffs and local property taxes. Uh, look at every railway station and steamboat wharf, and you will see them crowded with young men and women leaving the country. I see that none of them would leave if they could make a respectable living here. The reason why money is scarce in this country is because every year, millions of dollars are drawn away from the province to the treasury at Ottawa. And when it goes there, it never returns. I think I've heard that more than once since I've moved to the province in a non-historical context. All right, conclusion. So just a few takeaways, right? So what I wanna insist on through my research, and it's still just beginning, it's still kind of being conceived of, is a failure to conceive of immigration itself as a nationwide problem. Um, to Nova Scotia, it's a Nova Scotia issue. To Quebec, it's a Quebec issue. Um, so there's really no organized response. And it says a lot about how people conceive of Canada at that point. And they still see it as this collection of disparate uh, colonies still with different fortunes, different destinies. So it's perhaps not um, a failure of political imagination in a sense of finding policy options, but organizing a strategy and seeing this as something more than individual provinces. And all that is always in conversation with the ominous presence, as it still is today, of the United States. And there will be the consecra consecration afterwards, uh, many years later, especially during the Laurier era, ironically, uh, a liberal, consecration of the national policy as this great national institution, uh, meaning a high tariff policy, keeping you know, American goods out to an extent so that a market in Canada, a distinct market can grow and jobs can be created north of the border. And it's a hundred year romance that almost completely eclipsed the old grit indictment of MacDonald, an indictment that I presented here in the form of Prosper Bender, James Frazier, um, Richard Cartwright, Mackenzie Brown, um, Honoré Bougra. So those figures are easily eclipsed by the you know, still shining star of McDonald, um, who you know, despite his many failings in regard to indigenous peoples is still being held up as the motor of Canadian early post-Confederation Canadian history. And finally, last bullet point of the night, uh, I can hear cheers, uh, an invitation to the challenge, uh, to challenge the narrative of inevitability meaning colony to nation, moving gradually from these distinct colonies to something that's cohesive under responsible government to an independent nation as we kind of know it today. So it's easy to assume that Canada, as we see it today, was the inevitable way of being for the northern part of North America, that that was the natural or optimal state of things for these colonies when in fact there were other policy options, other paths that could have been taken. Um, in 1864, 1874, in the 1880s when Prosper Bender is writing and well beyond. So I invite people to keep challenging that narrative that is still built into textbooks, um, especially as we study the making of a transnational Canada with large anchors in American cities. All right. So if you want to learn more about related topics I've touched upon,
uh, in my research up to this point. Um, I have a few articles there. Feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, as Shirley knows, I'm pretty active on Twitter and um, you can also visit my website as well. So I think I took you for quite a ride tonight, uh, talked a little bit longer than I wanted to, but I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your no holds barred uh, critics or critiques rather, your criticism as well. Uh, so I look forward to the conversation. Thank you everyone. Uh, and thank you for showing up. Thank you to the organizers as well. Okay, uh, uh, it falls to me to be the uh, round of applause here.